Um, I'm going to open up the questions now. We're going to take groups of three or four questions. When you speak, please introduce yourselves, um, say what organization you're from, please speak into the microphone. Um, as I said, we have, we're streaming live as well and those people listening online can't hear you unless you're speaking into a microphone. Um, okay, I shall take a sweep from this side um, around the room that way. You just snuck in there, so at the back, <laughs> at the back, and then Bernadette, and then these four are taking the first round. So just someone, who's got the microphone? James, uh, just here at the back, please. Sorry, technical hitch. <laughs> <laughs> it's all much too good to be true. <laughs> yes. Here we are, glorious surround sound. Um, <laughs> yes, I, um, part of my role invo involves going to New York and chatting to people about post-2015. And the one general point that I picked up about the HLP report was a lot of people saying, oh, it's just an input. So I wondered from, from your experience, to what extent do you think different governments have engaged with the detail of, of the panel's recommendations and how they're responding to the detail rather than sort of taking a, a priori view, well, we don't need to think about that now, or else being very enthusiastic about it? Okay, you pass the microphone forward. Hello, my name is Bernadette Fischler from CAFOT and Beyond 2015 UK. Um, I've got actually two questions, but one's very short. Uh, every part of evaluation, we're a little bit here to evaluate how the high-level panel report has unfolded so far, also ask the question, what went wrong? Uh, what would you do differently next time round? Or what, where would you see any course corrections? And I'd be interested to hear, especially from Homi and David, from your experience, what would you have done differently if you could turn back time? And the second question is, um, Sometimes the high-level panel, because it is a UN Secretary General's high-level panel, is being perceived as, uh, or is being pushed back because of that, and seen as part of, um, well, seen as uh, too northern or too focused on donor countries. Um, did you experience that also in the take-up of the report, and given that the high-level panel recommends very clearly that poverty eradication and sustainable development should be at the center of the post-2015 agenda and now already in the course of the discussions on the outcome document for the special event, people are pushing the sustainable development bit out a little bit. Do you think that has anything to do in a reaction, in a pushback reaction? And either way, what would you do about that? Sorry, that was actually three questions. But, um, <laughs> okay. uh, I might impose a limit on the number <laughs> of questions per question. <laughs> right, if we just pass back here, please, yeah, and then you in the front. No, it's you. <laughs> um, my name is Julia Modden. I work for Action on Disability and Development, uh, which is an NGO that supports disabled people's organisations in Africa and Asia. Um, and my question is really about the link to the next part of the process, uh, particularly with the Open Working Group on Sustainable Development Goals really getting into its swing now. Um, we are going to be in New York next week um, at the UN General Assembly, and there's a side event there, which is really targeted at Open Working Group members. Homi, I understand you've been invited to speak, um, so... I've been invited. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to put a bit on advertising as well. <laughs> um, and uh, the, the question really is how to make that link properly, how to make sure that that incredibly important message, which we're absolutely behind on, no progress unless it's progress for everyone, really gets through into the next part of the process. Um, and. Talking about the dissemination of the report, I've been um, working with some parliamentarians in Kenya in particular, um, with the Kenyan government to try and get those messages feeding through into, into their processes. And it, it looks like that is happening, which is great, but it's obviously an ongoing process. And really, I wanted to ask for your advice on how best can civil society support the high-level panel to do that? What plans do you have as well for making that link into the next part of the process? 
Um, and finally, obviously, we're an organisation that works on disability, and there is a particular issue there in terms of how do we actually measure that, um, because there's so little information available. And a, a really important part of this data revolution idea for me is how do we make sure that we're getting the right data on the right groups, and that includes disabled people. So how do we get people on board to make that happen in practice? Thank you. And if you just pass forward, please. Thank you. Uh, Women for Justice and Peace in Sri Lanka. Uh, around the world, there are sections of uh, people in countries who are oppressed by their own countries, and uh, they don't have millennium development rights. Um, there, so these countries uh, receive conflict insensitive aid that has been exacerbating conflicts in the southern hemisphere for the last 50 or several decades. Um, this is uh, freedom of information I got last month from FO, FCO. Um, the projects uh, Sri, uh, the UK is doing in Sri Lanka in the south, there are two types. One set of projects in the south, um, whereas the government is preventing the UN, ICRC and other NGOs from going to the north and helping those war ravaged people. And the second set of projects uh, that are being done, uh, that is going in one direction, the government is going the opposite direction of oppressing the people more and more. The one set of projects is just trying uh, to see if there can be reconciliation or peace or whatever. The, de the government is going dead against the project. And now the UK government, in spite of the recommendation of the Foreign Affairs Committee last year, is now going to Sri Lanka without, um, for Chogum uh, 2003, without laying conditions. This is uh, for decades of human rights organizations and the UN bodies have been making, asking Sri Lankan government to change their uh, policies uh, to decrease the, uh, the uh, to, to do away with the oppression of uh, to serve justice to the op oppressed ethnic minorities, but the uh, this UK government is going adamant. Even Sorry, last what's week, the, what's the question here? Uh, question. This is a very serious comment to FCO and DFID. So they will have to take this into consideration. That is my appeal. My appeal. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, so we have, I'm going to leave you to the next round, I'm afraid, if I may. Um, we have questions, some detailed questions about the politics um, and how this is going to be taken forward. And then we have this broad question about how we might see um, practice changing um, on the part of donors, particularly in this case, um, as a consequence of a shift into, a, you know, a greater attention to conflict and violence. Sorry, that wasn't an invitation to anybody else apart from the panel to start answering those questions. You can all have your go in the next round. <laughs> David, can I start with you? I um, thought Henry was answering all the questions. <laughs> uh, okay, that's a fantastic set of questions. Um, 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 so, um, the first, I'm sorry I didn't catch your name, the first gentleman who spoke, um, but you're from the Transparency and Accountability Initiative. Um, and your question was about the detail and what engagement is there. I think, I think it's been surprisingly high, actually. I mean, we're, we're all, uh, or a number of us are heading to New York next week for the annual UN General Assembly high-level meetings, and we'll, we'll get a much better sense then. But I was in um, a, uh, an event in the United Nations in June, and I was surprised to hear ambassadors from... Uh, several countries engaging on really specific points from within the high-level panel's recommendations. So it's clear that if the high-level panel report has achieved one thing, it has helped to get the debate going around some of the crunchy issues that will need to be tackled in the next set of goals. And I think you know, if it's done that and raised some ambition on that, I think that's, that's a good start. Um, Bernadette, your list of questions, um, surprisingly. Um, what would we do differently? Well. Obviously, the Howell Panel Report is brilliant, and, um, and there's nothing to criticise it. However, I mean, uh, uh, there was some illusion. You, never, you're right, it wasn't the high-level panel's fault that we had nine months to do the job. That was in the terms of reference. And 
and, 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 and Homi picked up on this issue of means of implementation. It's going to be critical to a political agreement on the next agenda. And the high-level panel had some very useful ideas about partnership, but I don't think we, we really got to grips with this issue of means of implementation and what that meant in practice. And, and partly that's, we only had so much time. Partly it's actually, the debate hasn't really got going internationally, and I'm hoping it, it's starting to now. If you, if you have a conversation about health or education, you know, there's a whole bunch of people who've been thinking about what the next health goal needs to look at like for the last 20 years, you know, ever since the MDGs were agreed, they've started thinking about what comes next. That hasn't, so, you know, whilst there's lots of disagreement about specifics, there's a lot of agreement on what the sort of, the list of things in the conversation are. That hasn't really happened on means of implementation. So you, it's very difficult to have a really engaged conversation with someone on what, what should the next set of framework say about intellectual property rights or technology transfer. Um, I'll let others answer your other questions. Um, um, Julia, your question about disability. Well, I mean, it's, it's a big challenge. I guess part of the, the high level panel's proposal was we're putting it out, this out there as a challenge and as Homer said, you know, it's not more and better data. It requires a revolution if we're going to do this properly and that especially if we're going to, to count all the people who need to be counted. So that was a, the gauntlet, if you like, that the high level panel was laying down. There is some evidence that there's, there's value in doing that. When the MDGs were agreed, although I was uh, still at primary school then, the, um, the, um, thanks Ayan, the, um, <laughs> Uh, that a lot of people, a lot of countries pushed back and said, you know, all of this is too difficult to measure. And, and, and there's no denial that there are still some measurement issues out there, but actually I think the MDG, there is evidence that the MDGs drove progress on data and what you can measure. And the idea is that the next goal should do the same. Uh, and, and finally, the lady who spoke about the, the, your concerns about Sri Lanka, well, what I would do is flag what the, the high-level panel report had to say about ensuring uh, effective institutions and that all people within a country are given uh, equal rights. It had this very strong agenda on no one being left behind from whatever ethnic group or geographical region they're from. They should, uh, no target should be met unless it's met by all, all groups. And it also had a very strong message on voice and that all people in a, in a country have a right to have a voice in the decisions that affect their lives. And I think those are, whilst you know, the next development agenda is never going to go into country-specific issues, if normative standards like that can be agreed internationally, that will have, a, I think, a tremendously positive effect. Thank you. Hermie? Um, I think that... Um, uh, I'm, I'm not quite as sanguine as David that governments have taken on board all the, uh, the detail and messages of the uh, panel report and uh, I still see a fair amount of uh, uh, formal statements being kind of, you know, positions being taken by governments and being read out at uh, the open working group, uh, which is quite a different process. It's still very much the information gathering and fact finding part of the open working group process rather than the engagement negotiation discussion phase um, but so you know it's 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 maybe just too early uh, for them to uh, really get into the uh, 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 some of the nuances of uh, the arguments in the, uh, the the panel report and you know time will tell uh, to, w to what extent they find that um, articulation of the issues a uh, useful way of framing them. Uh, you know, lots of people have talked about the shortness of the uh, panel uh, uh, process. I have to tell you, I, I think that was a real blessing. <laughs> uh, from your perspective. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I, certainly from a personal point of view, I'm not sure I could have survived too much more of uh, uh, the panel. But I also think there's a, um, you know, there's, there's something to be said for uh, uh, having a deadline and, um, and meeting the deadline. And uh, these, these are issues around which one can one can discuss almost endlessly uh, without necessarily getting any closer to the uh, point. And I certainly observed in the, um, uh, the, the, the panel deliberations uh, uh, 
the, the, the pace of discussion and involvement kind of picked up, <laughs> shall we say, towards the end when everybody actually knew that something had to be delivered. That's when engagement really, uh, you know, became uh, fierce. So I, I'm, I'm not in the camp of those who feel we were shortchanged, uh, uh, etc. Uh, uh, on that uh, uh, process. Um, I, there, there, there was a question about, you know, can we be doing more within countries to, you know, sensitize, uh, and, and I think the answer to that is yes. Uh, you know, this is still very much of a New York agenda and a New York process, and I live in Washington. I was in, at an event uh, yesterday in uh, Washington. No, nobody has briefed people on Capitol Hill on the high-level panel report. Um, you know, now that's not uncommon because typically you don't brief people on Capitol Hill unless there's a piece of legislation which is uh, pending, and there's no legislation that's pending on uh, uh, on this. Nevertheless, it's going to take some time uh, for uh, them to feel uh, comfortable with some of the implications of the uh, panel report, and it's certainly something that one needs to uh, think about. Uh, and that's, you know, in one country and maybe not the most important country in terms of what actually needs to be done on the ground and in many developing countries I think that there's a, 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 a lot of discussion uh, to, uh, uh, to take place. And, and then finally, I, I think there's a really difficult issue around what one does with governments that are not responsible and accountable for their own development. It is the spirit of this report that says that ultimately it is national governments that are in control of their own destinies and that take responsibilities for that. And that there is only, only a very limited amount that the international community can do to change that hard fact. And so while I, you know, sympathize enormously with the plight and the suffering of many people in Sri Lanka, it's, you know, this is a, this is a struggle which in some sense needs to be, um, uh, need, needs to be taken on by domestic politics. It's, uh, it's not clear to me how one can use an international process like this uh, very easily to try to, uh, uh, to, to, to try to change things except by getting governments to understand and benchmark themselves against others. And that's where the power of these ideas like leave no one behind, the power of ideas of uh, the importance of institutions really comes to bear because it gives domestic constituencies something to say you know, look, over 200 countries agreed that this is important. Why is this not happening in our country? Uh, and in some sense, that's, I, I don't know, maybe that's the, the, the best that one can do. Um, so it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very, very difficult issue um, uh, because certainly the spirit of this is that uh, it is, uh, uh, you know, countries themselves that drive their agenda, and if they're not doing it in a responsible way, there's not all that much that the international community can do to change the reality on the ground, except to try to help them change the, uh, the politics and the dynamics of that process. Thank you, Amy. No. Yeah, I'll just try and um, add a few things. But definitely, I, I think the issue that has been raised very seriously about the experience of oppressed minorities around the world. My concern with the data revolution is kind of twofold. One is that a data revolution does not change the power balances or power imbalances for people who have been historically oppressed and excluded and politically persecuted. So there needs to be real care that the, the hype and the excitement around the data revolution doesn't overshadow the structural conversations that need to take place that address those imbalances globally. And then the second 
uh, point that I wanted to make slightly about the, the progress and, and um, the kind of data perspective is that I feel like it's also at risk of being quite an extractive debate. If it's something that's driven only by governments and there's going to have to be a significant investment from the corporate sector to fund this, I don't necessarily see it um, being the tool for empowerment, particularly for communities like uh, people living with disabilities, that it needs to be. So I think that we need to be careful um, around that part of the conversation. Um, to respond to Bernadette's question on poverty eradication and sustainable development, I think that you can really see that as the political process continues and the conversations become more difficult, that they aren't being seen as fully integrated yet and that one gets thrown out at the expense of the other. Um, I think one of the things that we should be continuing to push for is a single integrated agenda that combines both the sustainable development and the poverty eradication pieces. Um, and finally, in terms of kind of what traction the high-level panel has and which governments are engaging with it, one thing that I was very surprised by is the level to which the Secretary General's report, uh, recent report, A Life of Dignity for All, I think it's called, um, has ownership of the high-level panel report. I mean, my assumption beforehand was that the SDSN, the Global Compact, and the high-level panel were all kind of equal players, and they definitely don't come out in that way in the Secretary General's report. And I think he refers at a few times to my high-level panel <laughs> and some of the recommendations that it makes. So, I mean, the complex and confusing politics within New York um, aside, I think that's actually something that does deliver legitimacy to the high-level panel report and means that we can leverage what's come out of it in certain ways. But obviously, it depends on, on which country you're talking to. <laughs> and on a whole load of other things that may happen <clears throat> between now and then. Thank you. OK, I'm going to start with this side of the room this time. So Sam at the back, the front here. Anyone else on this side of the room? OK, we'll take these three and then one more from this side and then that will be the, in the next round. Thank you, Claire. My name's Sam Attridge from the Commonwealth. Uh, my question is directed to Homie. Hi, Homie. Um, when you read through the high-level panel report, um, uh, you appreciate and we all know about the importance of accountable institutions and governance, etc., at the national level. What struck me was missing was actually around the global governance and reform of global governance, um, which are key enabling you know, factors surrounding trade, for example, and even there's issues here around SDG convergence of MDG convergence, and actually different countries' understandings of these agendas and actually the reality of whether these will converge. Um, and there was some mention about a, you know, a stable financial system, for example. But so I was just wondering what the, if you give us some insights into whether any of those discussions were had and what the appetite is for um, pushing for reform of global governance um, to deal with collective action problems in the new post-2015 world. And our, uh, one quick question was, was there anything on domestic resource mobilisation? I was struck as well by the absence of any targets in there in the global partnership. Thanks. Thank you. Do you want to just pass it forward to Ken here in the brown jacket? Yeah. Thanks. I'm Ken Bluestone. I work for the Age International. And I, I suppose I'm not the only person in this room that's struggling a bit with how do we go from the inspiration and the vision and the simplicity effectively of what the high level panel is able to achieve as a communications tool but also providing us with something compelling to the next two years and the, I mean for lack of a better word, the opaqueness um, of the process going forward and, and I guess I'm struggling because picking up on something that Homie said, you know, there is who's the right person to, or the right set of people to be having certain types of discussions. And what you put into certain processes, you're almost guaranteed to get perhaps certain outputs. So if we're trying to get something that's inspirational and, and ticks off David's boxes, um, are we going to get that success by having a New York-based um, set of negotiations through missions? Or what do we need, basically, to get that? Um, and, and in particular, picking up on something that Neva has brought in as well, which is you know, where does 
civil society to come into this because I think we're at risk actually of falling straight back into the trap of having a black box again. Um, we don't have any clear avenues or paths for the civil society involvement of the type that really is aspirational of what we've been talking about now. And then finally, I guess it's where does the high level panel fit in with this now? We have the report, we have a group of high level women and people who are very inspirational and have contributed a lot, but what role are they going to continue to play in this process? Thank you. And if you just pass forward to the gentleman here. Uh, thank you for the panel so far. Um, my name is Gareth Wall, I'm from the Commonwealth Local Government Forum, just around the corner. And um, I just wanted to. Uh, uh, two quick, quick questions. Um, particularly on the consultation, I was interested from the neighbour's side on about how the consultation uh, worked. Obviously, the local governments themselves were also part of the consultation process, but are seen quite differently than obviously the national negotiations. Um, so, a bit of a re reflection on uh, how that, how you felt that went, uh, and whether you feel the engagement was there. I know we hosted a, a consultation in Kampala, um, and we felt, felt it went quite well, but. Again, it's, uh, local governments kind of pushed in with civil society as oh, well. They're not the real people that are going to negotiate how this happens. Um, I was interested also if you could reflect on the role of local government in um, the national agenda setting, whether the subnational agenda setting is actually part of that or not. Um, it doesn't seem to come out in the report. The, the role of local authorities is very clear in the report and is to be commended. Um, uh, but the role of Agen national agenda setting in the role of local governments isn't. Um, a final little uh, point which uh, uh, Homi may or may not want to uh, comment on was uh, just the role of um, the actual high level panel itself in the, the politics of particularly of a country's buy-in. Um, I'm, th I'm thinking particularly of, of India uh, and issues I've heard there in terms of their representation on the high level panel uh, and the endorsement from the, the national level and obviously India is a very key player. Uh, for achieving uh, the post of our goals. So I was just wondering if there was any interesting reflections there. Thank you. Thank you. I mean, it strikes me there's sort of two themes coming out of these questions. One is about taking the panel's recommendations and the kind of level of ambitions there as possibly a sort of high watermark of what's possible in the post-2015 agenda and thinking about how to safeguard that, what the politics are of making that happen, how to implement it. And another is to say, you know, how do we focus on, imp on moving up from there and improving what's on the panel, thinking about the things that have been left out. Um, I have one um, question that's come in online, which will be the fourth question in this cluster, which is about um, the role of youth. Um, it's been pointed out that a youth high-level panel was suggested and whether um, what the panel think of that. And to sort of supplement that for me, I mean, I felt that there was a a huge amount of involvement from young people as a sort of self-defined group in the, um, during the panel process, perhaps more so than I'd seen before. And I'd be interested to know what difference that made and what you think having young people involved in such a sort of self-conscious way as young people made it, what, what was in the report that wouldn't have been in there had it not been for that engagement um, of young people in the process. But I'm going to start with Nova now to give you a moment to think about that. Okay, um, so um, Gareth, I'm sorry, I didn't, I'm not going to be able to answer all parts of your question, but um, one thing that I thought was really interesting was that one of the lessons learned from the MDGs is about this huge disjuncture that existed between what was agreed at the international level and then actually where implementation took place. And the role that, I mean, um, one of the many roles that local authorities will have to play is if we go into this structure of having globally agreed goals and then nationally defined targets and then hopefully universal metrics so that there's some kind of comparability um, at the global level, in that process of nationally defining targets, local authorities are going to have to play a central role um, to ensure that one, it is something that is, that's feasible but also that ambition isn't, um, isn't diluted. Um, to kind of try and touch on Ken's um, uh, questions. I agree that it's a really opaque process going forwards and it'll be really interesting to see where we are in two weeks time and if we were having this conversation then what would have come out in the wash um, but at the moment it's quite hard to know where the high level panel report fits in um, but another learning that I would take in terms of the role that civil society can play there were a number of excellent individuals who in some way shape or form have a civil society background 
um, in the composition of the high-level panel, but I do feel that that could have been stronger. Maybe one of the lessons going forwards for the UN system is actually how do you integrate civil society so that they have um, a better representative and a better stake in influencing the decisions that are um, taken over the next two years. Thank you. Thank you. Um, let me uh, take on uh, Sam's uh, softball questions. Thank you, Sam, <laughs> as always, for the easy ones. Uh, uh, there was a there was actually a fair amount of discussion on global governance reform, and uh, there are pieces of that in the uh, Goal Twelve uh, that you can recognise. But you know, I think at the end of the day, one also has to be. Uh, cognizant of the fact that uh, uh, this is a uh, UN process and a lot of the global governance reform is not actually about the UN. It's about all kinds of uh, other parts of the multilateral system, but not necessarily parts of the UN. And one of the big difficulties I think that one has is how do you get coherence in a system where you've got lots of different players, each with their own mandate and their own governance structures, and there is no actual overarching governance of that, uh, of that system. So uh, I think that that's just an outstanding uh, question, and I suspect it's going to remain outstanding through the period leading up to uh, post-2015. On your more specific point about uh, domestic resource mobilization, yes, it was discussed. Uh, there were even ideas about uh, certain targets, etc. Ultimately, in the prioritization process that uh, uh, the panel went through, it kind of uh, uh, fell by the wayside as something which is uh, really important, but probably uh, most countries will um, you know, choose to be doing it uh, anyway. Uh, I, 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 I did want to just pick up on this question of, you know, can the UN produce an inspirational document? Um, so I think the Millennium Declaration is pretty inspirational. Uh, I also thought that the um, uh, the SG's report just now was uh, quite inspirational. So I certainly don't think it's impossible. Uh, will it happen? Uh, that, you know, one can point to as many examples of non-inspirational documents as inspirational uh, documents. So I think that that uh, all uh, remains to be seen. That said, I think it's, um, I think this is a process which uh, will not produce the desired outcome if it only happens in New York. I think it has to be also addressed in capitals and in countries. And so when you asked about the role of civil society and the role of some of the uh, individual panel members in their personal capacities, I would say that uh, you know today there is a lot that they can do to bring the discussion to capitals, to get the engagement of people in capitals on this. And that conversation tends to be quite different from the conversation of uh, the PRs in uh, New York. So the more that happens, I think the, uh, the better the outcomes are uh, likely to be. Uh, local governments, I think there's a real desire to bring them into the process. Uh, I think like other stakeholders, uh, you know, they're not represented at the United Nations and therefore they're not sort of, you know, formally in charge of the, uh, the decision-making uh, process. That said, and I think it's fairly clear in the panel report, nobody imagines that um, any of this can be implemented without local governments. And in many ways, the leave no one behind is actually driven in, from an implementation point of view it's driven by local governments because one of the big divides is the, the spatial divide. And uh, we know that a lot of inequalities are associated with spatial inequalities, even if they're not necessarily caused by spatial inequalities. But then the way in which you deal with that will often be through specific uh, 
uh, uh, changes at the uh, uh, local government uh, level. And then finally, on the question of the youth high-level panel, uh, I think it's correct to say that this was an idea that was suggested by two panel members, and so I think the rest of the panel would endorse it strongly. And, uh, <laughs> and, you know, uh, we uh, uh, would think it's a uh, great idea. And, and what, what young people brought to the panel process, I think, was this absolute commitment to change and to be a change agent. And anybody who wanted to think or say, oh, we're doing great, you know, there's been a lot of development progress, we've had the best development decade uh, uh, ever, you know, let's just keep going, guys. Anybody with those kinds of ideas was quickly disillusioned by meeting with young people. Mm -hmm. uh, they want change, they want it now, they want to be in charge of the change, and they had plenty of ideas about how to go about that. Thank you. And David? Um, okay. Um, I'd just like to echo some of those points in youth. I mean, it's very hard. To, it's a bit like doing an evaluation without planning for it before you've started the project. You know, what, what impact did youth have on the Hannibal Panel Report? I think I, I, a bit of sort of self-publicity. It was, uh, it was the UK who sort of had a particularly youth segment in the London panel meeting, which was the first panel meeting that mm -hmm. kicked things off. And we put that to the Prime Minister he said, that's a great idea. We, I don't think any of us quite knew what was going to happen. And, and, it, and it was, by my personal view, the most exciting thing that happened at the London panel meeting. It was really interesting, it was really exciting, there was a lot of energy. And there was probably one main message that came out of that, which was, this isn't about you crusty people sitting around that table. This, what you're talking about is about us, and you better make sure that whatever you come up with is about us, and is relevant for us, and is owned by us. And I think, you know, it's hard to exactly pick out the bits, but we could all perhaps do that if we wanted, but actually, I think that message was reinforced through the Bali meeting, and through the Monrovia meeting, and the New York meetings, and the panel very much had, had that in mind as they were discussing what they were going to propose. So I think, I think you've were very influential. To, uh, on domestic, I'm, I'm just going to pick what I like out of this. <laughs> on do, re, domestic resource mobilisation. And Homie, do you remember a very interesting conversation about this, where there was a suggestion to have a target of 0.15% uh, domestic resource yeah. mobilisation? Because, because the panel actually felt this was really important, and they wanted to have a target in the framework about it, and wanted to come up with something. In Indonesia, and we had done some work as to what yeah. that target should be. And don't forget, well, some, some of us had, yeah. yeah. And Indonesia said, well, speaking as a middle income country, and I rather suspect that other middle income countries might feel different, this, is, this number isn't very relevant to us. We don't feel that we own it. And, and then, then we got into the debate well, aren't some high income countries actually trying to cut their domestic resource mobilisation uh, and, and lower the tax burden? And you know, it's a complicated issue, and it's very hard to pick a number. The panel wanted to say a positive statement about it. They wanted to recognise that it's a tremendously important part of the equation. What they did say was that um, we need to make sure that governments can raise the right amount, and that's where the target uh, for reference, uh, 12E, reduce illicit flows and tax evasion, and increase stolen asset recovery by X, um, X dollars is, is, comes in. It's about the international community working together to make sure countries do let the, get the legitimate uh, resources that they should be entitled to. But it's a good question, and it was a really interesting part of the debate. Um, local government, universal agenda, national targets. Many countries have a federal system, so you're already going to have to have a conversation at a sub-national level. But I think most importantly what Homie said is really important, that actually if you're going to be leaving nobody behind, then that conversation really has to be with all parts of the country, mm -hmm. and, and starting with local government, uh, uh, amongst many others. Um, and then Ken, you asked how to influence the process going forward. Uh, well, I think that's what you asked. I mean, it's going to be about 193 permanent representatives in New York. They're the ones who are going to be in the room. And I don't dispute everything that's been said before about how you get there and what you need to do. But if, if, you know, if you're thinking influencing strategies, it's how do those 193 permanent representatives vote? What do they say? How do they align themselves? What do different blocks decide? Um, I, I think it was Homie who said, you know, really, what the dan if we're going to sort of get a, the best possible debate, then we need to get national influence in there and get, if you like,
have what they say in that room not just be about the new York bubble, but it be about what people in their countries really want to happen, whether that's the United Kingdom or whether it's any country in the world. And, and so that's a big challenge over the next two years. Thank you. I was quite struck just coming on to this, um, the point about local government. The, in the SDSN report and their proposals for goals, they have they suggest a goal for urban for, for urbanisation for urban issues and a goal for rural issues. And in discussions with them, the, the thinking behind that, the sort of theory behind having those goals, is that that then provides a vehicle for local authorities, be they rural or urban, to have a sort of way in to an eventual agreement that that becomes their goal that they can then you know the municipalities can be can be held accountable for okay we're nearly out of time oh we've got five minutes left okay like super super quick questions sorry you are being squeezed but that's just um the panel the peril of putting your hand up last so super quick <coughs> questions and then super quick answers in the nature of a summing up <laughs> okay, um, this, this will be a super quick question, I hope. My name is Robert Palmer, I'm from the Queen Rania Foundation in Jordan. Um, so last week uh, I was in a meeting in Oxford and uh, Amina Mohammed stood up at the beginning. She said that um, the member state negotiations would probably start early 2014. And her words were, and then the door will close. But we hope a window will stay open. <laughs> so clearly the next six months or less are going to be very critical in this process. So that the, the first issue is, is what is planned over the next five, six months sufficient and sufficiently focused? And after that, what's the best way forward for finding these windows and getting the right message to the right people? Um, and um, just a second point, um, when it comes to some sectors, like education, they're still not convergent on a lot of different processes ongoing, some of which will shoot far beyond um, September 2014. Um, so how do we get the right messaging at the right time to the right people? Thank you. And then two here in the front. Um, I'm <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh my sorry. goodness. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm sorry about the, the sort of sound effects we're getting here. It's, uh <laughs> uh, my name is Amanda Lundy from Plan International. Um, so you spoke, Kami, about a gap in accountability in the MDGs and needing to be teased out more in post-2015. Can you talk a bit about how civil society actors might be able to be pushing this agenda as obvious stakeholders in participating in accountability mechanisms in the future and how that might relate to human rights mechanisms that currently exist? <coughs> Hi, uh, I'm Catherine Scott from Save the Children. I just have a question, um, building on what some of the panelists have said around the fact that a lot of this conversation is happening in New York. Um, we know that at the UN General Assembly there'll be the first meeting of the African Union um, endorsed high level committee on post 2015 who are coming to um, refine and crystallize the positions in the African composition. Um, and I just wondered if there was any reflections from the panel on what kind of strengths and weaknesses or, or also opportunities and threats of that process and, and how you see the two processes kind of working together. Thank you very much. Right. Um, let's, go, let's go back to the order we started with and ask Comey to answer those questions. Anything else you want to say briefly in the way of a summing up? Almost all of the questions now are about uh, New York politics, about which I know nothing. So I'm going to defer to Next. David on all of that. <laughs> David, the man with the answer. <laughs> no, not at all, because I, it is really difficult. I mean, uh, just, I, if, if, bearing in mind that we've got probably two minutes. I mean, it, uh, let me map out the process as I understand it. That might be helpful. So we've got an open working group on sustainable development goals that was established at Rio. That's ongoing. It's still in information gathering phase. In February, it will start negotiating its report. We don't quite know what form that will take, to be honest, um, because nobody does. Uh, but then in the summer, uh, that report will be published. There is also a separate conversation on sustainable development financing, also established at Rio. The UN has asked that group to accelerate their work, so they're also reporting ahead of this time next year. 
There'll then be a, a decision or a decision, decision moment. So there'll be a, another UN General Assembly um, meeting in September next year. And the Secretary General is likely then to be member, or is likely to have a mandate to produce a report to kick off the final stage of negotiations. What we're doing at the moment in New York is trying to negotiate that mandate to, so that he, ha he can then prepare in order to do that report next, uh, next summer, autumn. And then the final negotiations will start. There'll probably be a summit in 2015. So it's quite a long and convoluted process. What I would say is, I mean, I, I, I say what Amina said. I think part of our strategy is that we should just not accept that, sorry, I'm turning my back on people. Mm -hmm. We should not accept that the door is closed. I think that's part of it. And that, that, there's, uh, that everybody needs to have a voice through this process, including through the final phase of UN negotiations. Certainly the UK will be arguing that civil society needs to have a strong voice in that process. Um, but, but, yeah, but we've got a lot of work to do to make sure that um, that's a, a sensible process, that it's evidence-based, that it's technical as well as political. It will be political, but that's fine. It needs to be. That's what the UN is for. It also needs to be informed by the best possible information um, and, uh, and, above all, the views of what people really want to happen. Thank you. I'll keep, try and keep it to the 30 seconds. Um, I love the fact that it's the UK government telling us that we shouldn't accept that the doors are closed. Um, I think that we might take that on board as a, as a key message for the next two years and ensure that they stay open. Um, the other thing that I wanted to say really quickly, um, sorry, going back to a question previously on youth, if youth want a high-level panel, youth should do a high-level panel. Don't wait to get permission or authorization from the UN or from a government. Go ahead and do it. Like One of the inspiring things about young people is that they know how to collectively organize. Um, another initiative that the Participate uh, group have done is a series of ground level panels in four countries around the world. So getting a different set of experts on poverty, who are people who live in poverty, to talk about what they want from the post-2015 process. And it's been fantastic, not only the process itself, but also what's come out. So I think one way of generating and continuing momentum around this is to continue these kind of initiatives that give a different perspective and a different flavor. Mm -hmm. um, and in terms of the high-level committee um, on, from, that's been endorsed by the African Union, I think this will be a really key group because if you look at kind of who the key stakeholders are, particularly in light of like a post-MDG, post-2015 agenda, I think that they can be key. So what comes out of that, um, that grouping will be really important and it would be great to see that the inputs that they make are taken seriously and that they are listened to. I think, yeah, that would be my closing point. Thank you. Um, I mean, I think it's interesting. There's a lot of sort of questions about, you know, what's going to happen, what's going to happen. And I think we just all have to remember that politics is, a, is an art and not a science. And we can't know. There's no certain route here where we can say, if you pull this butt lever now, then these goals will pop out in 2015. That this is all about, you know, in a sense, what's the phrase about making the road as you travel it? And to some extent, what happens between now and then is a consequence of the decisions that we all make. You know, in my case, the research that we do, the campaigns that we run, the, um, the, you know, the different people that are brought together to discuss this. So I think although, of course, we all want to know what's going to happen, it's also unknowable <laughs> because it depends on a whole series of things that haven't happened yet. Thank you very much. As I said, thank you enormously again to all the people that made this happen in ODI and in DFID. Thank you very, very much to our panellists. It's been a fascinating session to all of you, to all of the people who have been um, listening online. I hope the technology worked. Um, and see you all again very soon.